good to see everybody tonight. Appreciate your presence as always, and hope our discussion as we uh, finish uh, Acts chapter 7, at least we hope to finish Acts chapter 7, I, I think we will tonight, and get into Acts chapter 8, uh, and certainly invite your thoughts and your comments. Uh, anything that you want to add to the discussion, feel free to jump in and participate as usual, and uh, always look forward to, to hearing your thoughts and and uh, and ideas and comments uh, as well. On Sunday, we were discussing the section from about 37 through 50 of Acts chapter 7, the gist of which is that Stephen is bringing his speech, his sermon, if you want to call it, it was a sermon, uh, his speech, his defense before the Sanhedrin as to the charges leveled against him that uh, he was blaspheming God, blaspheming Christ, blaspheming the temple, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, uh, all, all of these things, the, the trumped up charges against him, that he's given his defense. And the last, about the last 40 verses of this, really from about verse 20 through verse 60, he's talking about Moses and bringing his speech to a conclusion, a climax, a crescendo, as it were, uh, to show them uh, the, the fact that uh, Moses prophesied of the Christ, and all of the prophets that prophesied of the Christ, your fathers uh, persecuted, killed, um, uh, all the things that they said against them, uh, about the prophets and so forth. And he's saying basically that you are worse than your fathers because you killed the one that these prophets, including Moses, uh, prophesied that was going to come. This just one that uh, he talks about, talking about the Christ, that you have killed him. And so that's, that's kind of where we, uh, where we are. And we talked about the fact that and we're going to, uh, when we finish up this chapter, we're going to talk just a little bit more about, uh, about that thought uh, of that the Jews had everything possible to convince them about the Christ. And still do, of course, we do today. All, all of the things that, uh, that are recorded in Scripture. Matter of fact, over in John chapter 20, and I think Bill uh, made, may mention this other, uh, the other day, where we're talking about basically human nature doesn't change. You've got, you've got the Jews who had, uh, who had 1,500 years with God. They had the law. They had all the prophecies prior to that, all the things that, that they needed to uh, demonstrate, to show them without a shadow of a doubt that this is the Christ. This is the Son of God. Yet they rejected him. They nailed him to the cross. And we're talking about a little bit about the, uh, the apostles as well. Hey, Bo. Uh, the, uh, the apostles, all the things, think about, think about what they witnessed, the things that they saw during his three and a half years with them, all the... Uh, uh, the, the various miracles, including the, the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 and the walking on the water and the, the healing of the, the blind and the lame and the deaf, the raising the dead, all the things that they witnessed. And then after that, even 40 days with them, where in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, Israel, it says that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, right? In other words, Something that can't be argued with. And yet, even at the end, after he was raised, what was the reaction? Well, when Mary Magdalene told him, you know, the Lord's risen, what was the reaction? They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. And then even after that, uh, where Thomas, you remember, wasn't, uh, wasn't with them at the, the very... Uh, the time that he appeared that, uh, that first Sunday. He said, well, I won't believe it unless I can actually put my fingers and hands 
in the nail prints and, and so forth. You have Judas who uh, betrayed him. You have Peter who denied him. You have Thomas who doubted him. All of them forsook him and fled. Uh, it, it, wasn't just, it wasn't just Peter. They, they all forsook him and fled uh, before uh, at the, the time of the trial and prior to the crucifixion and so forth. And even after he appeared to them, to them in Galilee, the Bible says at the end of that that, that, uh, that even some doubted even at that point in time. And I don't really know exactly what, what all transpired there, what the meaning of all that is. Of course, we know that they all, they all except for uh, Judas, of course, did great things after that and believed him and, and, uh, and so forth. They, they made amends. But you just think all the things that they, that they witnessed. Stephen is talking about that they had all these things, they had, they had, had all the evidence, and yet uh, they, uh, they, they killed the one that could, that could provide life. Well, we're talking about it the other day, Bill. You know, it's very, very similar to us today in a lot of respects in that where we have in, in John chapter 20, and verse 30, 30, 30, 31, what does it say? Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of these disciples. Which are not written in this book. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Absolutely. So what about the religious world as a whole? What about the world as a whole? How many people actually believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, was the Son of God, is the Son of God, died for our sins? The vast majority of the world doesn't believe that. Uh, and then if you, if you boil it down to the ones that's actually in compliance with uh, his law, it's an infinitesimally small number. The Bible talks about the fewness of it, and we talked about uh, that before. How, how few is few. You know, many is going to go in the, the broad, uh, destructive way. Few is going to find the straight and narrow way, and so forth and so on. So my point is human nature hasn't changed all that much. Some, sometimes when we talk about the Jews and talk about why in the world would they do what they did after seeing what they saw. When you think about Moses, we talked about that a little bit uh, Sunday, where you see you, they saw the ten plagues on the Egyptians. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They, they saw the parting of the Jordan River later on. All the things, they, they saw the Egyptians dead on the, the, the shore. All the things that they witnessed and they saw, and yet when they go out into, uh, they get into the promised land, uh, what was the reaction? They murmured, they complained, they set up idol worship, they, they, they had all kinds of idols that they uh, worshipped. We talked about some of those, Baal and Ashtaroth and Chemosh and Milcom and Diana, and you just go on and on and on of the the, uh, the things that they did. Matter of fact, Moses wasn't even gone 40 days before they'd made a calf that Aaron said, I just took out, they just took out the thing, I threw it in there and out came this calf, you know, I didn't, I just threw it in there and just, this calf came out. Uh, he, he probably didn't fashion or anything, I, I wouldn't think, right, it just, just kind of happened. But anyway, um, so the people, so, so when we talk about the Jews and we talk about the apostles and we talked about uh, different ones, uh, uh, the fact is that's the nature of the world today when you get to thinking about it. And unfortunately, it happens in the church as well. Uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about it, I think, in, in terms of when we, we say, if you'll, just, if you'll just get me out of this bind, if you'll just help me this one time, I promise you, Lord, we talked about this before, you know, guys in war and in difficult situations, not just that, but, but when you're really sick and you're, you know, kind of on your deathbed and this sort of thing, or, or a loved one, it's really bad. if you, it, you just help me out this one time, then I'll never forsake you. I'll, I'm going to be with you from now on and that sort of thing. We make these promises. Then what happens is the general rule. I'm talking about in general. I'm not talking about specifically. In general, it goes back to where it was. And that's the, way the, that's the way the Israelites did, didn't they? That they, they, uh, God would uh, deliver them. And then they'd have a period of 20 years that they'd, they'd be in some type of uh, bind or 18 years or 40 years. He'd, they'd pray to God and he would finally deliver us, send a deliverer, a judge or, or, or whoever. And did just help us this one time. But then they went right back for a period of at least 1,100 years that we know about uh, prior to that 400 uh, intertestament period. Yeah, go ahead, Lord. 
We had a pole break one time, got two guys up and it fell with those two guys and broke them up real bad. They had some broke those one. But they were both hollering, Lord help me, oh sweet Jesus, save me, all that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they just went on and on while we was in there trying to get them free and get them in the ambulance and all that. It wasn't a week later, though, both those old boys were just cussing, just like they always yep. had. They hadn't changed them. They hadn't changed them. Either. But they were believers right there in that yep. hour or so. <laughs> Well, that, that's kind of my point. That, that illustrates what I talk about, where you, you find, the, find the Israelites were that way for a period of at least 1,100 years we know about, and, um, and, and probably the, the other 400 that, that, that's silent in Scripture. But not just that, it's been that way for the, at least the last 2,000 years. And even prior to that, even, even, even in the patriarchal age, it didn't change. Uh, uh, a man is, is, is the same. Go ahead, Dave. Yes, sir. Go ahead and line with what you're saying, uh, Coach. Um, when, when Lazarus was... Um, yep. And that, good example. Uh, good example right there where if even if one word would be raised from the dead, they would not believe. Yep. yep. So even all of those miracles. And Jesus told human nature right there. Yep. In the heart, the power of hard-heartedness. Yep. Yep. Well, we, we talked a little bit about that in Luke 16 uh, the other day, a little bit. You weren't in here, but we talked about Luke 16, about uh, the, the conversation between uh, Abraham and, and the rich man. And well, just if you, if you want to help me out, just dip the tip of your finger in, in water and cool my tongue. At least send Lazarus back to testify to my brothers, lest they come to this place. And what was the reaction? Well, let, let them hear Moses and the prophets. No, but if one rose from the dead, they would repent. Well, what was the answer to that? No. They believe in that Moses in the there you go. They will not repent. Even exactly. He won't roll from there. And like Israel was talking about, if you look at the, the case of Lazarus, after the, uh, in, in, in John 11, after he was raised, what did, what did they try to do in John? Uh, they tried to kill him. Tried to kill him again, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't change, uh, unfortunately. Well, when we get to the end of this, beginning in verse 51, we won't read all of this, but he's bringing his speech to a, a close. And he uses some very strong language. It reminded me of the, the kind of language that Jesus used in Matthew 23. You remember when, uh, when he, would, he had eight woes, I believe, in Matthew 23, if I can it right. And then, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe unto you, blind guides that, uh, you know, that do all these things. Well, Stephen is doing the same kind of thing, and he calls them, you know, Danny, well, let's look at verse 51 real quick, and then we'll finish up this uh, chapter. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they've slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. In other words, these prophets that uh, they persecuted, these prophets that they killed, they were the ones speaking of this just one, notice it, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who received the law, by the, in other words, you have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. In other words, you had everything that you needed. You had the law. The law was given to you. You didn't keep it. And not only did you not keep it, you, uh, you persecuted and you killed the Son of God, the one that all these prophets, including Moses, foretold was going to come. As a matter of fact, uh, when, he, when he's talking about Moses a lot, Moses told him, he said, he goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 18, where Moses said that there's going to be one to raise up like unto me, at whom you shall hear, and so forth and so on. So Moses, way back, you know, 1,500 years before, was talking about this. And he, he says that you, you didn't listen to Moses, you didn't hear, hear any of the prophets. When they heard these things, notice the expression, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on with the teeth. Well, when you think about being cut to the heart, you think about those in Acts 2 that were pricked in their heart, but of course they had a totally different uh, response than, uh, than the Sanhedrin and these that uh, Stephen was testifying before. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. That must have been quite a scene. Just, just think about that. Saw the glory of God. Saw Jesus standing there and said, 
Behold, I see heaven, the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They didn't want to listen to that. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, and stoned him. They did what the law required in Leviticus 14, you remember, take him outside the camp or outside the city. But they, of course, they didn't follow through with what they're supposed to because uh, there, there wasn't any trial or any witnesses or anything like that. So they, they, they obeyed part of the law. They're taking him out. We're going to take him out and stone him. But uh, there wasn't anything from the Sanhedrin that, as far as uh, anything written to, to, to verify that this was justified. Of course, it was not justified at all. They cast him out of the city, stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Well, the witnesses that they were talking about was those that brought the false charges against him back when they said he's blasphemed God, he's blasphemed the temple, he's blasphemed the Holy Spirit, all of these things that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's mentioned earlier that he's uh, defending himself against and laid their uh, clothes down at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. They stoned Stephen calling upon God, they weren't calling upon God, this is Stephen calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this end to the charge, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, <coughs> go ahead, Charlie, and then I'll, I'll finish my thought. All right, in uh, 1 John 5, 10, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God has a witness in himself. <laughs> He that believeth not God hath, hath made him a liar because he liveth not the record that God gave his son. There you go. Well, these people are very similar to that uh, statement. When they, they didn't believe what was said about him. They didn't believe the prophecies of him. And uh, even the things that they saw, uh, uh, they didn't believe it. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Way back in his ministry, what did they say about when they couldn't deny the fact that he cast out the demons or did various things? He did it through Beelzebub. So they attributed to, uh, they did, didn't attribute it to God, they attributed it to uh, Beelzebub. He cast out devils through Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, and, uh, and so forth. So. This is, this is what uh, Jesus had to put up with. And, of course, this is what the apostles had to put up with as well when, uh, when they were doing the things that they were doing, that, uh, that there, there would always be uh, an excuse of the people not to believe it and to, uh, to, to punish them and to uh, make their lives uh, hard as well. So it was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, as we said, the infallible proofs, the... Uh, the various things that were said in in uh, in John twenty thirty thirty one, and even uh, even if we went back to Romans chapter one, even the things that are created uh, were were such. There's nothing created that that was created without Him, and yet uh, in, in Romans one and verse twenty it says the the things the things that He created are evidence enough. If you didn't have anything else, are evidence enough, so that they are without excuse. So if anybody doesn't believe that uh, that God is, or believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. Uh, they they have no excuse uh, for not believing. Uh, the, the fool has said in his heart, "There's no God." There's so much evidence everywhere, and uh, and yet uh, they didn't believe Jesus, didn't believe in Him, and killed Him. And uh, and the, the same kind of thing basically uh, happens today. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about. Uh, uh, crucifying him afresh so people can even uh, crucify him uh, a second time as it were uh, by by not believing in him let me just read just a couple things that uh, that uh, Wayne Jackson the, these are the Wayne Jackson and uh, uh, B.W. Johnson are the two commentators that are used primarily and he talks about uh, the rage that kills verses 54 to 60 he says uh, in other words, when he when he uh, said what he did to him about you stiff-necked and unsurcised, so what he said that was enough. They were cut to the heart, and he said con contrast that with Acts two thirty-seven, which we talked a little bit about. 
They ground their teeth in anger. They were full of hate. Uh, but Stephen was full of the Spirit, under control uh, of the Spirit. Uh, he looked heavenward, saw God's glory, saw Jesus uh, designated as the Son of Man, standing on his right hand, and so forth. They kept stoning him, of course, until he was dead. And then Saul is pictured there uh, as being one that even though he didn't take part in the killing, evidently, but he held a cloak, uh, and, and he regretted that. We're going to talk about that a little bit when we get into Acts chapter 8. He, he regretted it very, very much. He talked about it many times. Can I ask a question? I've always wondered if, if um, Luke, in writing this, didn't clean things up a little bit and to just say that Paul, Saul was standing there. But I've always wondered if he actually took part in stoning him because it says later in the scriptures that he, he was instrumental in killing him. Some people. Yep. So. He could. We're going, to, we're going to look at some of these verses in, uh, in just a little bit when we get into these first three or four uh, verses. The indication is that he didn't actually take part, but that, as it were, he gave his consent to it. He gave his okay to it. I don't know, but I don't know beyond that. You yeah, could have been. I don't know if he threw a stone at him or not, Bill. I don't know. He could, he could have. I don't know. Well, it's, well, isn't. Uh, You were blank. Sorry. <laughs> 65 is rough. Um, Wait till you get 78. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, when you, when you, do, do, when you do, you just jump in. <laughs> yes. yeah. is, Lord's not 78 yet, but he, <laughs> you get close. I don't like him in a couple months. I'm six months oh, behind. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you talked about uh, Brother Johnson, I believe they're just reading from, said that they gritted their teeth. Uh, yeah. And, when it said gnashed on with their teeth, I always meant, thought that meant they actually literally bit him with their teeth. But it kind of, it kind of looks the way he reads it, is it? Yeah, it, it, it kind of looks like that, the way it's, the way it's uh, expressed here, um, Lloyd, where it says, they gnashed on him with their teeth. Mm -hmm. The King James in, ver in verse 54. Right. So I know they were gritting their teeth, I guess, and just, uh, just, you know, just in total anger kind of thing. And whether they actually bit him or not, I don't know. Kind of looks like they did based on that. Almost they, they ran on him, then they started the stoning. So I remember years ago when I was still working, there was a young couple that killed their child, and they bit this child to death, both yeah. of them, the girl and the boy, yeah. until he was dead. Wow. And I guess the kid was crying, screaming or something, they just went crazy. Wow. I just can't imagine somebody getting that yeah, mad. I know. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. thought maybe that's what was, they were doing when they said national. We've seen people to kind of tighten the jaw up there, you know, like that sort of thing. It's kind of the way I picture it, but okay. anyway, well, wasn't it's a bad scene. Uh, in a leadership role, so he basically gave down the commands. Who's that? Paul? Saul. Uh, yeah, Saul. Paul. I don't think he was at this time, Scott. The, the, in, the indication was because even though it mentions him, this is the first mention, I believe, of him. And, of course, he... Uh, in chapter 9, we get to chapter 9, you know, we, we have the story of his conversion and and so forth. But uh, did they say he was a young man at this time? Young man. As a matter of fact, uh, a couple of the commentators, one said they thought it, Saul might have been 35. Other One of the others said he thought he was about 30. So, I don't know, give or take two or three years in there. 30, but 35. He, uh, he was uh, set forth to capture as many Christians as he could. Yeah. And I, it, I, what I, it, it just might think so, that he had people under him following his direction. Well, as a matter of fact, after, well, after this event, we, we have the picture of Saul uh, uh, given for us a little bit, Scott, in verse 3 of the next chapter. He talks again about Saul and says, and as for Saul, we'll get into this just a minute, but he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women or hauling them out, committed them to prison and so forth. And then, of course, we have, have the have story after that. We have a little interlude there talking about Philip and what he did in the, in the, in the, in the case of the Samaritans, the Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah. And then we'll come back to Saul in, in chapter 9. But um, the indication is that he didn't wait long to, to do the kind of things that he was doing. And, and um, as one of you said... Uh, when Bill was talking about earlier, he regretted it over and over because there's at least there are at least seven or eight references that Paul made himself to what he did in the church and persecuting the church 
And we'll look at some of those here in just a little bit as we get into uh, chapter 8. Charlie, hello. All right, in Isaiah 43, 10, it says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Well, there are about three or four chapters right in a row there, 43, 44, 45, uh, that, uh, that God in his own defense over and over says, there's nobody but me, there's no God but me. And yet, uh, people deny him even today, you know, there are many gods or, uh, and, and so forth, as we, as we said. It's always been that way that people, for whatever reason, uh, deny God. Well, what do they say about the, the creation of the universe? People today, well... Kind of a big bang kind of thing, or just might have been, been a big, might have been a big, yeah, might have been a big bang, but it, it was, it had a cause, you know. <laughs> God was the cause of it. But anyway, yeah, it's yep, there you go. <laughs> All right, let's get into uh, chapter eight. Um, I wanted to to read the first uh, twenty five verses, and we did, we're going to talk about that. Get in that a little bit uh, tonight about the. The situation with Philip and uh, going down to Samaria and what happened there, uh, and that goes through about verse uh, 24 and 25, <clears throat> and then we'll later on we'll get into the the situation with the eunuch, but we won't we won't get that far. We won't get far enough into even the discussion. But I would like to at least read the, those first 24, 24, 25 verses. And let me get some of you guys to help me out here. Um, Bo, if you would read. Um, Verses 1 to 3 of Acts 8. Bill, if you would, 4 through 8. Um, Tommy, if you would, 9 through 13. Uh, Dow, 14 through 17. And Israel, 18 through 25, if you would. And then we'll stop there and then we'll come back and start making a few comments. All right, go ahead, Bo. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church with, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, healing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which... Before time, and the same to use sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that him, himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the uh, from the least to the great, saying, This man is the, the great power of God, and to him they had charged because of that long time he had. We wished them for sorcery. But when they believed Philip preaching the, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women, and Simon him, himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, 
he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the fault of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, and that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they that had testified and preached the word of the Lord returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Okay, thank you guys. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so back in uh, the first three verses, uh, one of the commentators mentioned that these three really are more like the previous chapter. It doesn't really uh, make any difference as far as the division of the uh, the verses. It kind of goes with the uh, the last part of chapter 7. But uh, Saul consented, or uh, according to B.W. Johnson, he used the term approved and gave his voice for the death of Stephen, that he didn't actually take part in the stoning, according to him, because we don't have a record that he did, may have, but he certainly aided and abetted uh, that, and, and was in agreement with it, basically, is what uh, he's saying. That the, but the memory of that for him, I don't think ever really left him. Do you? When you get to thinking about what, uh, what he did in... Uh, in answer to that, the, the, the stoning of Stephen, the havoc that he created right after that, his desire to stamp out this sect, to stamp out this religion, to work against Christ with everything that, uh, that, that he had. You had, to, you had to give him credit in the sense that even though he was wrong, he thought he was doing right. He said on one occasion, I lived in, in all good conscience before God to this day. He really thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. And he did it with all of his heart. I mean, he poured his heart and soul uh, into what he was doing. But he evidently, he agonized over it many, many times. Now, there's a statement uh, in Acts, uh, let me just read this real quick, in Acts uh, 22, because I want to get to some of these, the comments that he, uh, uh, that, that he makes himself. And I think this is one of them. In Acts 22, uh, when he's giving his... Uh, giving his uh, defense, as it were. He's recounting what happened to him uh, back when he, when he obeyed the gospel. But in Acts 22, uh, down about verse uh, 19, And I said, Lord, they know, this is after Jesus told him to uh, get, out of, uh, get out of Jerusalem and so forth, and I'm, I'm going, you're going to be a, a testimony uh, to, uh, to me, they're not going to receive your testimony, but I'm going to send you in other places. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So he's recounting uh, his... <clears throat> Uh, situation there in the stoning of Stephen that, that he was in agreement with it. He was uh, consenting unto his death uh, that evidently according to what he's saying here that he didn't actually take part in it uh, other than he, he was part of it other than the, maybe the throwing of the stone itself. Brother Lester, Go ahead. So, yeah. so Saul would have been one who would have been cut to the heart and gnashed on Stephen with yeah. his teeth. Yeah. I mean, if he was consenting to all of this, he would have been uh, very angry at what Yeah, he was, he was very, very angry at what Stephen was saying, wasn't he? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. No question about that. And he may have participated to some degree. I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe. Probably definitely in the mob cheering it on. He wouldn't. Yeah. He, front of the line trying yeah, to he was. He, was he wasn't going to try to stop it, was he? Uh, he, he was definitely in agreement with it. He was definitely a cheerleader. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he may have, may have uh, taken part, uh, like Israel said, about the gnashing of the teeth and the anger that he showed because evidently right after that, he, he, he started creating, as the Bible says, a lot of havoc uh, for the church. Every, everywhere he went he, uh, un, until, 
uh, Jesus appeared to him, uh, he, he was going to stamp it out. He was going to do it by himself if he had to. So uh, then verse 2 says, Devout men uh, carried Stephen to his burial. Not the disciples necessarily, but pious Jews. Uh, deeply impressed by the gospel, but yet uh, perhaps not brought to uh, the acceptance of the gospel, but they were uh, devout, as, perhaps as Cornelius was described, perhaps as devout later on in Acts chapter 10. But be that as it may, they were very sorry for what happened. They made great lamentation over Stephen. And then in verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Uh, the mad violence that he uh, was part of at that time, he often recalled. And I want to look at uh, four or five of these in just a second. Look in, uh, well, we, we've seen Acts 8 and verse 3, what it said about him. They made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. And then look in, uh, look in Acts 9 uh, and verse 1. Just going to look at uh, three or four of these real quick. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Uh, look in... Uh, just real quick, let me turn real quick to some of these real quick. Acts 22. Uh, in the Go ahead, Bill. James, where it said, reading out the threats and slaughter. slaughter. In the New King James, it says, reading out, reading out threats and murder. Yeah. Which is the yeah. same thing, but murder seems a little more. He killed, he killed a lot of people. He, he, obviously, he killed a lot of people. There's no question about it. And he, he regretted it to the very end. Uh, an, another one just real quick uh, thank you Bill for that in Acts 22 uh, let me find it real quick in Acts 22 in verse um, 4 I persecuted this way notice it unto the death this is kind of what Bill was talking about a while ago binding and delivering into prisons both men and women as also the high priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of the elders from whom I also received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So he talks about it again there. Um, also in Acts, uh, since we're in Acts, Acts 26 and verse uh, 10, when he's appearing before Agrippa in Acts, uh, let's see, I think I got the right one, Acts 26, look at verse 9 beginning. I thought, I verily thought with myself, See, he was wrong about that, but he thought this is what he ought to do. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and in me, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. Notice it, and this is what, what Bill's talking about. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So another example, uh, another example of uh, of him recounting uh, some of the things that, uh, that that he did and took part in. Look over in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, even later on, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, down about verse 9. After, he, after he's recounting all those that saw Jesus after, uh, or, or saw Jesus after the resurrection, he talks about himself uh, see him, uh, seeing him. In verse 8, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. And look at verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet or worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he's still, uh, he's still talking about uh, what he did. Look in Galatians. Uh, just one more example. A couple of examples real quick. Galatians 1 and verse 13. For well, you've heard of my conversation or my life in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, notice how he expressed it there, beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Look at uh, Philippians, Philippians 3 and verse 6. I'm pointing all this out uh, just, to, uh, just to show you how, even though we find him there uh, doing what he did, 
of watching the event in the case of Stephen, he did so much more after that, some horrible, horrible things, and yet uh, he was a chosen vessel of God, and he, he did, did more than anybody else in all likelihood. Uh, all the rest of them combined, probably. Uh, and he tried to make up for it. Philippians 3 and verse 6, he's recounting uh, the, the fact that he's a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And he said, uh, of, of the Pharisee and so forth, in verse 6, Philippians 3, concern, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. In other words, I, car I, I carried it out to the nth degree, uh, uh, wherever I could. And then one more real quick. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13. He says, well, let me look back at verse 12 real quick. First, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, or he injured a lot of people, did more than injure them. He, 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 he killed them and had them, had them killed, had them in prison. But I obtained mercy, notice it, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, what he thought he was doing right, but uh, he said I was ignorant. I, I was very uh, foolish of, of what I did. But I am what I am because of the grace of God. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, but uh, he saw fit to call me an apostle. And he was very thankful, very appreciative, and he did everything he could to make it up. So that just shows you when people say, well, God will never forgive me for what I did. Here's, he's a, a, a prime example in Israel about... You can't beat him. You can't beat him, can you? Yeah. Can't be worse than that, can you? He can't be worse than Saul of Tarsus. Can't be worse than Saul of Tarsus. Good point. He's and yet, a great example for us. <clears throat> he's a real great example for us. He's, he's exactly right. Exactly right. And great great thought. That's right. If, if God can forgive him, he can forgive us or anyone else for, for what they do. Absolutely. Even those that murder people, here's, here's a murderer. Murder, murdered uh, God's own people. And yet he forgave him and uh, became the great apostle, of course, that, uh, that did so many things to expand the church and to build the church up and did more than anybody else in all likelihood to, uh, to further the cause. As a matter of fact, at the end of his life, he was, uh, when he was under house arrest, the, the, last, the very last thing he said, that he, 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 he preached to him from morning till evening those things that pertain to the kingdom of God and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that he tried to, to stamp out, the kingdom that he tried to stamp out and at the end of his life. He was doing everything he could to, to build it up and to, uh, and to make it stronger, which he did. Charlie, go ahead. Well, in Galatians 1 9, it talks about whenever uh, you heard the gospel and you preached a different gospel, yep. you were accused. Absolutely. It's not a different one, is it? It's maybe a perverted one, but it's only one gospel. Yeah, Absolutely. It's the same way you uh, learned it. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your good comments and your reading. Appreciate that much. <laughs>